Thank you, Nicole. Thank you for the introduction and uh, hi, everyone. So welcome to our fifth edition of the Ethics and Philosophy of Futures uh, meeting. It's an open group uh, discussion. So usually it's about one hour, one hour and a half. I hope you have the time to stay with us today because we have a really good program for you. Um, just so you know who is the team behind, um, Chris, I let you introduce uh, yourself and uh, APF, and then I, I say a few words about our guest of today. Okay, thanks, Sylvia. Yeah, I'm Chris Mayer, um, and I want to thank the APF for sponsoring advertising and providing the you know, technology support for this, Nicole especially. Um, APF has a, a wide array of open and member events. And if you have any interest in joining, just let me know. Shoot me an email afterwards. But, but thanks again to the APF. Thank you, Chris. Uh, maybe just a brief overview of our last events. Um, we are now available on the Association of Professional Futurists YouTube channel. Thanks to Nicole, who has done an amazing job uh, with the design of the video and putting them um, so that they are available. So the first one was about taking humans out of wars of the future uh, with Rome Gaioso. The second one was on biotech, business, and ethics with Timothy Dolan. And the last one last month was about metaphysics, morals, and machines uh, with Lisa Reset, Elizabeth Shield, sorry, and Bibiana uh, Klausa Bozak, um, who is actually also APF. And today I'm absolutely uh, delighted uh, to invite Marcus Busset um, to the stage. And Marcus will introduce us to his special guest. He has uh, designed a wonderful program. You had a few uh, periods that you had available, I'm sure, in the invitation. I hope you got a chance to, to look at them and, um, and hopefully read them. Otherwise, um, um, Marcus, Stephanie, and Ananta are going to help us um, digest them and discuss them. So the presentation is going to be about uh, 40 minutes long. Uh, and then we're going to really open it to the audience. So feel free to react on the chat um, during the presentation. And then we'll, we'll push the question um, at the end of the 40 minutes to make it really a group um, discussion. And uh, right now I'm going to stop my screen so that you see our guests and I'm going to introduce Marcus to you. So Marcus, Dr. Marcus Besset is a futurist and an educator with a keen interest in intercultural encounters. He has taught widely throughout Australia, having spent five years at a yoga-based neo-humanist school four years in an urban community school run by parent cooperative, seven years in Montessori primary and high schools, and 16 years at the University of the Sunshine Coast, USC, where he teaches courses in world history, philosophy of history, and sustainable futures. Dr. Marcus Busset also publishes widely and has co-authored Futures Thinking for Social Foresight with Richard Slaughter, 2005, and co-edited New Humanist Educational Futures, Liberating the Pedagogical Intellect, 2006, and Alternative Educational Futures, Pedagogies for Emergent World, 2008, with Sohail Inayatullah and Ivana Milojevic. So quite an impressive profile we have today. We are delighted to have you absolutely honored, uh, Marcus. And now um, the stage is all yours. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, uh, Sylvia. Appreciate being invited by the APF and given the opportunity to uh, share some thoughts on um, pushing the boundaries of ethics. Um, I'd like to, uh, I'm going to introduce both our special guests as we go along, but I'd like to give a little bit of foregrounding here first by uh, sharing uh, my screen <clears throat> and essentially making this point. First of all, Sylvia, I really enjoyed reading your little piece in that magazine, that online magazine, where you said it's our duty as futures researchers, foresight consultants and critical thinkers, sense makers and business leaders and educators to advocate for ethical futures. So like everything, I'd like to point out that ethics has a history, it has a context. And in some respects, some of the reading in the way that uh, Professor Nanta Giri and Dr. Stephanie Fischel 
have a function, we're all providing some of that context. I also wanted to point out that Indigenous futurity itself, which is a term that Laura Hajo uses, or Dr. Laura Hajo, uh, she, that challenges the location of ethics within Western philosophical tradition. I, I need to do this challenging and say, hang on a second, uh, particularly as an Australian, but I would imagine in the US it's very similar. I'm, white folk have a, you know, a bad rep in terms of trying to represent the other or speak on behalf of others who are not so privileged or so fortunate who have suffered uh, at the hands of colonialism. So I wanted to point out that, you know, the practice of settler knowledge, which is a lot of what we do in our universities, uh, and the settler knowledge production today is problematic because it tends to gravitate towards the academic, okay, or the expert who views the indigenous community as an object to which to apply theoretical frameworks. And I want to uh, underline here that that is not what any of us in this uh, session are intending to do. Uh, we uh, know that in a sense, you can't speak on behalf of, uh, simply because as Deleuze and Guattari uh, point out, you know, we lack creation in our culture. We lack resistance to the present. The creation of concepts in themselves called for the future form, okay, for a new earth and a people that do not yet exist. So Europeanization does not constitute a becoming, but merely the history of capitalism, which prevents the becoming of subjected peoples. So I wanted to flag that insight, um, and I will stop sharing the screen because for me, that sets the background and the context for what we're going to talk about. So as uh, Sylvie pointed out, I've spent a lot of time teaching, okay? And so when I get asked to do things, I try to be organized. And the, and the wonderful thing about my life, at least, is that I'm always being shown that I can't control anything, that everything is actually out of control <laughs> and that we've come with the best of intentions. So I had a, a shortened version of the YouTube clip that I made with Dr. Oh, Professor Anantagiri, uh, which I was going to show, but because maybe it's the weather here, it's not working so well, but Nicole is going to very kindly play the, um, the clip that Ananta uh, made with me and that we will share on YouTube. It's already there waiting for you in full, but we're going to play only 10 minutes of it simply because it's obviously going to be too long and it will take up too much of this session and then I will unpack some of that using the resources that I had created to help us deal with Ananta's thinking. I want to point out that Professor Ananta Giri has been working for the past 30 years or more with uh, subject to people, uh, uh, people who have been oppressed by colonialism. He comes from a colonized country as does Australia, as Australia. Uh, he has worked with uh, Chipko movement people and so on who are resisting capitalism within India. In fact, that was the, the, you know, the core of his PhD work. He's an extraordinarily subtle thinker uh, who thinks across, he's a sociologist by training, but he's, he thinks anthropologically, culturally, historically. But like myself, we've both been looking for new ways to craft um the language that we can talk about the future in the sense that Deleuze and Guattari was saying you know if the, the future to come is not has not yet arrived yet we're still very much within uh, the capitalist episteme you could say if you want to be a, an academic about it but you know the world view so I want to actually ask Nicole to pull up Ananta you're going to have a bit more of an introduction from me because of course we, we're not being able to craft the YouTube clip. So uh, yeah, I'll say a little bit more there about Ananta. And at about 10 minutes, uh, Nicole, I'll ask you to just press stop and then I will unpack a little bit of what Ananta is saying. I, I acknowledge, as, as you're probably finding with my English, Australian English, it's horrible, I have to say. Uh, whenever I hear myself, I go, oh my God. Um, but, you know, um, I just wish I had a really cool accent like Sylvia does, because I think French sounds much better than Australian English. But I'm going to hand, I'm saying this because I want you to be aware that Ananta's English is very much an Indian English. So you're going to need to pay very close attention to what he's saying. And of course, I will then offer a gloss at the end. So that's from me. Thank you so much for Ananta for being here. He will obviously enjoy this uh, recording when he gets to hear it. 
it's uh, he's four and a half hours behind us, so it's like four in the morning there in India. Nicole, over to you, please. So this is my friend, Professor Ananta Kumar Giri, who's based in Chennai. He works at the Madras Institute of Development Studies, and he is a uh, professor who has published multiple books on multiple really fascinating topics. One of the things about Anantz's work that first caught my attention was his work on intercivilizational ethics. I've asked him to say a few words now so that he can provide us with uh, some reference points from which uh, we can take this conversation forward. So Anantz, I'm gonna give you the floor and I'm gonna be a very temporal person. I'm gonna have time. And, you know, I, I will let you know when, when we need to draw this to a conclusion. So uh, over to you, Ananta, and thank you so very much. Thank you with my heart, dear Marcus, and all friends co-present in this exploration of pushing the boundary of ethics. To this exploration, I join with this theme, intercivilizational ethics, the theme itself challenges us to realize that the conventional discourse and practice of ethics has been or is being and possibly unconsciously monocivilizational. And that monocivilizational binding of ethics has a deeper genealogy. For example, we all might have heard about Swami Vivekananda. And he was a great lover of Lord Jesus Christ, you know, a personal realization. But he said that the golden rule that do unto others as you would like to be done to you, Swami Vivekananda said that it is not the highest stage of ethical realization. Because when we expect others to do to us, that itself is limiting. A, an ethical path is no matter what the other to do, we must be ready ourselves to be and think and conduct as is good. So that brings us to a dimension of unconditionality, no matter what the other does. And that itself, the kind of the way that Swami Vivekananda opens up our conventional idea of the golden rule, it opens up very interesting ways of intra-civilizational, inter-civilizational, and trans-civilizational dialogue. Let us invite also here Emmanuel Levinas. As we know, Levinas says that the first a uh, test of the ethical is that can we look up to the face of the other, the other which is not in front of me but above me. That also, Levinas also here possesses the challenge of the unconditional. And here also we can open it up if we invite in a recent interesting work in his memoir, Amartya Sen who seems to be following a Kantian path, and I will speak a little more about it slightly later, Amartya Sen said that the whole path of ethics of the Buddha is an alternative to the social contract tradition. And, and, and Sen says that the social contract tradition means that the contracting parties must do to each other what is expected of them to do. But what when the contracting parties are not able to do what is expected of to do, then should we forget the culling of the ethical or the good that we have? And about the same said, of course, that is can be critically thought about. Sen said that the ethics of the Gita also falls within the contractarian tradition. And, but for Sen, that Buddha, a social contract takes the form of each contracting party doing specified good things for others on the condition that others must also do what they owe to everybody else. Buddha argued instead that doing good should not be so transactional. 
that people have a duty to do what they recognize to be good literature. So that opens up very interesting ways of multiple conversations. For example, Levinas, Buddha, and, uh, and Gandhi also here. Because the whole idea of the unconditional is related to what is called as trying ourselves, renouncing ourselves for a propensity for desire for truth. And that is also at the heart of Bhagavad Gita, what is called as Viskama Karma. Therefore, renunciation is a very important part of the ethical. And that renunciation also means that we renounce also the danger of ethical substantialism or ethical formalism. Because while the ethical in the sense of Levinas or the Buddha, it challenges us to always to be wakeful to our responsibility to the other. But there is also a reality of ethical conventionalism that binds us to ethics as customs. And it is in that spirit, again in a trans-civilizational way, we can look at Habermas's critique of what he calls as ethical substantialism. And while every Levinas gives priority to ethics, Habermas gives priority to the moral, but beyond the nomenclature, the issue here is that sometimes the moral also has a danger of substantially, substantively being closed into the right and wrong as the society considers it. And similarly, the ethical also has a danger. So Habermas here brings the challenge of critical moral insight developing from discourse. And but that discourse is not just the discourse of the critical reasoning. That discourse also points to spiritual. So we need to bring here the challenge of the spiritual in pushing the boundary of the ethical uh, and the moral. And it is in this context, in ACE ethics also, that recently a very interesting movement of thought which has emerged called Soma aesthetic. And this idea of the Soma aesthetic is by Richard Sutman, Richard Sutterman. And two of my friends have recently written a very profound work called Soma Aesthetics and Yoga Sutra. And, and, and what Soma Aesthetics does is to realize that how the ethics is to do with our way of living. And, and I think that also has a tantric dimension that our body, that and how, how do we live with our body, soul, soil, and the world? And how do we live properly? And yoga sutra, yoga also is a way of living with our body, mind, spirit, and the world. In his foreword to this book, Richard Sutterman is saying that the whole calling of both Soma aesthetics and Yoga Sutra is not just individual and enjoyment or improvement of the self, but improvement of the self so that one can more effectively help others and contribute to the creation of a better society and a better world. So here I would quickly like to bring another opening of dimension that is the aesthetic. Sri Aurobindo in his critique of ethical formalism in Roman civilization, he challenges us to understand the limits of ethical formalism. And he also brings the significance of the aesthetic. Aesthetic is something that Marcus, you also have written very insightfully. We need to bring the aesthetic as a way of opening up the ethical, the aesthetic and the spiritual. And that aesthetic also is a way where Sri Aurobindo makes a distinction between aesthetics and aesthetics. Aesthetics mainly focusing on the visible, aesthetics the invisible. And therefore, the whole question of intercivilizational ethics 
now needs to be trans-civilizational in the sense of this kind of transcending thoughts, which then means that both ethics and aesthetics have an immanent dimension, our practices, but also have a transcendental dimension. Mm -hmm. They have contingency as well as uh, creativity. And very quickly, I want to bring the question of civilization in the sense that the inter-civilizational ethics or trans-civilizational ethics cannot be, uh, you know, cannot be bereft from the challenge of what is called a civilizational transition. Because much of civilization, as Carl Jaspers has suggested, the whole origin and the dynamics of axial edge civilization, in fact, the whole axial now, today we would have to transcend the axial civilization to an alliance of civilization. Mm -hmm. And axial, axial civilization is predicated on violence. And the fundamental violence is against women, because in most of the axial civilization, the religion which have flowed from it, yep. women are not the priests. But women, the, you know, as the tantric, again, the homo tantricas, it is the divine goddess spirituality which animated primal human condition. But how did they vanish? They were killed, they were murdered. So therefore, the question of civilizational transition, we would have to really heal the civilizational barbarism. As Walter Benjamin has suggested, every document of civilization is a civilization, is a document of barbarism. Therefore, when I'm talking about trans-civilizational ethics, via the challenge of civilizational transition against the backdrop of both the entrenched violence of axial edge civilization and then modern colonial civilization which has produced genocide and epistemicide we need to think about civilizational transition as the challenge of trans-civilizational ethics and aesthetics helping us to move from violence to non-violence or ahimsa. It is in that spirit also uh, moving from anthropocentrism to a celebration of life. And, and uh, it is in this context, you know, if Immanuel Kant talked about, you know, the whole means and relations and, and kingdom of end. So today we would have to dance together with the ethics, aesthetics, and responsibility, not only kingdom of and as a variation of kingdom of God, but a garden of ants. And when there is a garden of ants, the meat So thank you. Now that was where my editing had actually stopped it just before Anantza started talking about uh, the, the Kantian relationship of uh, to uh, the other. Um, <clears throat> so some interesting comments coming along there, mainly from Ruth. Um, the um, question though that um, Sylvia asked about was uh, the difference between inter-civilizational as opposed to trans-civilizational. <clears throat> inter-civilizational is when we rub Buddha up against Kant, against uh, Levinas, um, against, uh, let's say, uh, Aurobindo, uh, which is something that um, somebody that also Ananta draws on quite heavily. So it's when we actually do a, a comparative encounter between civilizational ethics so that we can understand the breadth and sometimes the, uh, what would the term be? The, um, the contextual nature out of which net ethics emerges. Trans-civilizational is where uh, Ananta is taking a transcendent uh, approach to thinking ethically and it's not about the analytic it's not about the comparative it's more about a presencing and about a, an emergent poetics you could say and I, Ananta was going towards a poem that if you've read his paper that we shared he ends uh, towards the end of that paper he shares a poem called and and ends or ends and ends that he wrote um, in which he plays with that space. And so it's a space which is not so much analytic. It's certainly not informed by a Western ethical analytic. Uh, it's much more about being present uh, 
to the nature of being. I was going to say to the human, but it's, it's to the more than human, which is exactly where Steph is going to go in when we uh, have her talk to us in a moment. Sylvia, did I do justice to your question? Have I done, have I said enough? Yeah, absolutely. I just wanted to make sure that uh, everybody was able to follow up. And if I, if yeah. I may, another concept maybe uh, that was mentioned in the video, probably you are coming back on it, but Ananta was talking about uh, ethical substantialism or formalism yes. or conventionalism. So just wondering if at some point maybe we can explain a little of the concepts. Thank you. Sure. Okay. Thanks so much, Sylvia. Well, I think because <clears throat> Ananta was heading exactly into the space of the uh, ethics around the more than human, uh, I, it's time for me to introduce my uh, friend and colleague, Dr. Stephanie Fischel. She works at the university with me, and whenever I have coffees with her and we chat, I have epiphanies all the time. She's one of those people that always coming up with, she's thinking right on the on the cutting edge of her field, which is sort of the, uh, it's political science at some level, but I, I can't really call it that, Stephanie. Uh, but, so what I would like to say about Stephanie is that she's written a fabulous book uh, on um, the microbial state. She's written a number of papers, one of which we have shared with you. She's uh, a, a, an academic with a very clear and very um, profound voice, uh, and it's a real honour to work with her. And for me, Steph, I'm going to hand it over to you now and thank you so much for giving us the time also to uh, to play in this space. Thanks, Marcus. I um, really feel grateful for the invitation. It's always good, even virtually, to be in a room with people um, thinking about cool things. And I think that the future space is especially um, wonderful and important because um, the way I've looked at it is it, te it tends to let thinkers in who we can be speculative, we can talk about the way futures could work, um, and it feels less threatening to people if you're in kind of a straight policy or political science, at least that's the way I read it. So it allows you to really have a community where you can think differently and then move toward those different futures without people worrying too much about um, disciplines. And on that note, I, I think opening up again, um, acknowledging the country that I'm on, the Cubby Cubby people, where sovereignty was never ceded um, and the land is stolen. And um, I'll talk a little bit more about decolonization as we go on, but um, I'd like to recognize the leaders in this um, mob of people and how much work they do every day to recover their land to see that the, the country is taken care of here. And on that note, um, I think that we have a disciplinary, discipline, discipline problems and cultural problems with um, minimizing other kinds of knowledges. Right? Um, so I've started to see this a bit um, when indigenous knowledges start to filter over into my field, international relations or political theory there tends to be a kind of an, un, it might even be unconscious, but a minimizing this knowledge to a worldview or a cosmology, which of course it is. And um, one of it is recognizing that being trained in the Western intellectual tradition is also a worldview. So it isn't to say that, that we don't all represent worlds, but rather it's a kind of pernicious way to discount um, a knowledge of, of millennia and multiple millennia as not equal to Western science. Right, so we can see that quite clearly in the ways in which country is cared for here and the remedial burning and the understanding of the way um, the Australian landscapes works vis-a-vis, -vis, um, especially now climate change. So when we think about indigenous, indigenous sciences, we're the first climate sciences, right? Thinking about the way the land changes. And I think then to say that a focus on indigenous sovereignty in any work would look at um, looking at an ontology of land governance that recognizes this interbeing relationality and connection to country rather than just as a form of property as we tend to see it in western traditions right it's that we would use and in fact i think the state is implicated in uh, all sorts of ways in which in whole ecologies become resources and background to the way in which you take it out, right? And that includes bodies and enslavement and resources and resource extraction. So um, the idea that country is created when land, people, and the law live in common, 
and we can see, I think quite clearly, one of the elders from the Haudenosaunee tribe, this beautiful video about, um, we can see that the problems we're having with climate change and now with, you know, listening to everyone speak at Glasgow, that humans are breaking the law. And this is the reason we're coming up against the kind of changes that we're seeing um, at the biospheric level with the planet. And Western fantasies of um, pristine wilderness that's protected for recreation or con conservation, which tends the, the rewilding, the um, save, take certain people, take people off the land and let it just be the land really ignores this deep connection that humans create with the land and the beings with whom we share it. So you don't have country without people, right? And so this Western notion that we would remove ourselves from it um, is problematic. And I think um, will become even deeply more so as we move into the future if we don't begin to think of our more than human at both um, kind of the living and non-living of what we live among, right? And the worlds in which we uh, create together. And I do think it's good to remember that the, the humans and non-humans and ecologies are kind of caught up and torn asunder by Western science and our disciplines. Um, and this includes, you know, indigenous peoples, bodies, laws, cultures, religions, um, the right to our own bodies and self-determination are destroyed through all of these legal fictions that Western knowledge has created. Terra nullius um, here in Australia, as well as um, treaties in the United States with indigenous peoples that were, um, who are consistently broken um, and not respected throughout the history of the um, United States and, and, and the indigenous nations there. And then if we look at the killing and control of native species and of the land itself, this is also connected to the domination of human bodies and cultures. So often we see these assemblages where biocide and genocide meet. Um, and that is, and how, how can we challenge those ways of devaluing and, and separating human and non-human animals, um, especially when capitalism and colonialism will wrap them all up into a death roll, right? That profits only the very few. Um, and these extractive and deadly economic and political systems, if we want to talk as we were before about, you know, Western um, history, like through Deleuze and Guattari being a history of capitalism, um, these, the economic systems are propped up by Western science and philosophy. So the dominant Western understanding, un Western understandings of the world harbor all of these ontological and epistemological commitments that are focused on a a fictional, a fictional person, right? A fictional thing, um, atomized and individualistic, a consumer who's rational, who imagines the planet, other beings on it, just like itself. If there's no sense of deep pluralism there, just a rational liberal subject fixated on itself at the expense of others, as well as a deep um, human exceptionalism around the only way to think and the only way to be intelligent is through human um, frontal cortex, and we did, would not recognize other species as having the same kind of intellectual capacity. So, the in, so if we think about this, then the intellectual history of the colonizer was fed by these actions and the other way, right? And in this case, then, I think it's really important to remember, especially in disciplines that use decolonization as a way to frame their work, that's not a metaphor. Right? Decolonization means you're actually working on getting off the land, recognizing um, who, own, who, who is a caretaker of the land and how this should be worked. Um, and I think that's really important here in Australia. We're not saying, you know, the acknowledgement of country, again, isn't a metaphor. So what can we do in our um, scholarly work and in our institutions to begin to um, get money, resources, and land back to the people they were stolen, not just talk about what that might look like. And I like to, um, kind of one of my favorites to use, uh, phrases to use is from Stephen King's magnum opus. I know it seems like a strange place to draw from, but he has a beautiful reoccurring refrain in that that says, but there are other worlds than these. So I think we do need to remember along with, like there are also, as you would say, I think in the futures, there are other futures than the, these, right? Um, and how do we get to those? Uh, what possibilities exist for understanding how life and politics are bound together beyond all of these Western understandings, biopolitics, colonialism, capitalism, Western state sovereignty, 
Um, so for me, I'll, I'll wrap up talking about kind of the ways in which I think um, my work does that and how I think about ethics and then how I think about science. So I'll start with science. And I work in, in my, um, I'm really fascinated by analogies and allegories and metaphors and how they really do affect the way we think and act in the world. So I take the science of the very small microbiology and look about the way in which that micro world can tell us about the macro world. And I use mainly metagenomics, which is looking at having enough capacity in our um, computing and in our to be able to measure and look at whole bacterial communities rather than just a bacterium in the lab, um, which only tended to be certain kinds. And it turns out that um, we are a very interesting assemblage of multi-species groupings. Um, our own bodies are luxury liners for microbes. Uh, we are genetically, very little genetically human. So this starts our relations between humans and non-humans starts in our very body. And how can we foster that and create a deep sense of plurality within um, these communities using these metaphors? Um, I've had um, one of my interlocutors call this an ethics of commensalism, right? That we are commensal beings. We sit at the table together. Much of our food would not be uh, digested without the other microbes that are helping us digest carbs, right? So we're, we're sitting at the same table, like kind of literally eating. So I would say this is an entangled ethics or an ethics of a complex time. And following Donna Haraway and her work with, with canines and other um, and other ways of thinking about those species that we live with, um, sometimes then our normative and applied ethics tend to miss this enmeshed nature of the planet, right? It's after the fact ethics, business ethics sometimes comes down to how to not get caught, right? Unfortunately, like these are the things in which we're working with in these frames that um, don't nurture positive attachment to the world and consolidate a belief in the world beyond just its use value or beyond people as a use value or relatively thin imaginings of it. So if we have generous attachments to a living and non-living earth system, we're, and this is the piece I think that's important, we're, we're all dependent. And I'm right now working on viruses and viromes. And you know, it turns out there are a lot of viruses and there are a lot of viruses we can't do without. And we are also profoundly viral beings that have been shaped by uh, viruses inhabiting our body and, and changing. There's even a theory that our, right, Marcus and I reminded me of this, of our mitochondria, right, having viral origins. So this isn't a small task, I think, but it's worth fighting for in whatever way we can. Um, and I think that then this ethics means we can never rest easy on them, right? They're not a kind of checklist that you can then say, I am acting ethically in this way, because we may, our actions may affect communities and beings and critters and the more than human, and we don't even know it, right? I think, I think about the bacterial hand rubs we've all been using. You know, it's important during a pandemic to wash hands, to use, to think about this, um, but in fact, our bacterial communities are a very important piece of our protection. They actually keep things out. Um, our immune system brings things in and then decides if it's dangerous, makes markers of non-self to show what we should and shouldn't do. So if our decisions at all levels mean that our decisions are always deeply ethical, even when we don't think about it, right? What soap we buy or um, how we treat this or that. One of the things that comes up a lot, I think, when I talk about these kind of ethics is if you think about meat eating or actually any ingestion of, at all of, of something, we have to always think about how to live. We deprive of life. What's our attachment to that? What do we owe those beings? And it's never a place that you could say you fixed it, right? It's always got to be a place of, of renegotiation. So I guess an ethics of commensalism and an exit and an ethics of constant renegotiation, thinking through how our actions are always affecting us. Um, it's a con and I, I don't think maybe the world is, of course, the world isn't maybe even more complex. We have tools of which we can measure that complexity better, right? We can see the very small, we can understand physics at a different level because of our tools. But I still think we're working within the same place. And if we come back and I end with the in, in, indigeneity and indigenous futures, this is a place in which that was often never lost, right? This idea of a, of a, a rich and um, 
buzzing world filled with things we have to think about, I think is um, super important. So I'll just go ahead and stop it there and we can um, chat more in the, in the question time. Thanks so much, Steph. That's, that's great. And so much, um, yeah, so many things that you're saying there that I think resonate that in with what Ananta was talking about. And of course, point, uh, you know, in, when we talk about enmeshment, uh, our ideas, and we're, there was a little dialogue on the side here about language in the chat, you know, it, it, even our language usage it all point to that enmeshment. Language is, is a nexus or a network or a, even a fractal way of tossing out uh, elements that sometimes hit the mark and sometimes don't. But I love that idea of thin imaginings. <clears throat> to me, it's uh, we, we live in a, uh, a very poorly equipped imaginative environment because our past is so minimalized. It's been so shrunk. And I, I'm talking now as, as a historian as much as anything else you know, that the tools we have for, to engage creatively with our traditions uh, uh, have been impoverished. And, you know, that's something that Ananta is doing very effectively. And I'm going to move into talking about that. So I might do that now <coughs> by um, sharing the screen for a moment to, uh, to walk you through a little bit of uh, what I've been looking at and thinking about. So for me, and I'm going to drag this over here if I can. Can I do that? No. You know, here's Ananta. One statement that Ananta makes in, in the reading that uh, we shared with you all is that ethical awakening ought to help us in this process of realizing the limits of violence, okay, including anthropocentric violence on non humans. And that's, you know, very much what, um, Steph, you're talking about for, in, in, in the way that I, I read you and hear you and also respond to you at, at an emotive level you know, which is uh, that sort of uh, somatic level that Ananta again was uh, addressing with his soma aesthetics. But, and, and he, he ends this little statement talking about, you know, the way that we function are as meditative verbs of co-realization and responsibility. That's in an optimal world. Uh, and for you, Steph, looking at your, the paper that we shared with the audience, you know, talking about this concept of post-human. And I like the fact that, uh, I don't have it here, but that you actually talk about post-humanizing as a verb, which again echoes what Nunt is talking about as meditative verbs. The post-human is that, you know, knows that the subject, that's the liberal subject that you were addressing, Steph, as we have created it, that means we're all culpable, we're all responsible, has a special relationship to the degradation and dismissal of objects and the objectification of subjects. The objects are the food that we eat, the planet we live on, the subjects are the food that we eat, the planet that we live on, you know, um, and of course amongst that is the, uh, is the deep uh, roots that Indigenous peoples have that are epistemologies in their own right. They are ways of understanding the world in their own right. So for me then, I just wanted to point out that, you know, from my perspective, we've exhausted the humanist project that you know has taken the West and Western civilization to where it is. Okay, and it's time for what Steph called, you know, a post-human response. So I've been working on you know this concept of neo-humanism for you know three decades or more. And it's basically talking about well, what would a new humanism look like? And at the heart of that, I think, you know, to to be to move towards a transcendent ethical you know is to actually shift the grounds upon which ethics is is even thought about you know the substantive which is the anchoring ethics within a human and humanist perspective the formalist is the application of logic and the equations of the social contract and so on that's just to address those issues it's slightly sylvia you know to me i bring in devotion you know devotion is a, is a rational uh, uh, a form of rational thinking. It's just, it has different rules. And when we have devotion, then we feel connection to the world outside, uh, to the world inside, to the viral, to the, uh, the bacterial, to the organic, uh, as, as much as to very subtle and abstract aspects to do with the spiritual, which is something that Ananta talks about quite a lot. He much, is, well, not much, but a good chunk of his work is focused on what he calls spiritual pragmatics. And I've also played in that space with him because it's a really useful space. And in my um, uh, article on Homo Tantricus, 
uh, you know, I talk about, I use Walt Whitman's um, concept that, no, not Walt Whitman, Wallace Stevens, that we're playing a tune beyond us, but it's also a tune of ourselves. In other words, we are groping our way, fumbling our way through the uncertain, the unclear towards something that is more ethically holistic, integral, uh, and, and more also enabling of a key set of elements that we need to manage the future in optimal ways. And I'm going to come to that in a moment. But just wanted to, I, I came up with this concept of homo tantricus. <laughs> I've got a spunny, spelling mistake there that I haven't even noticed because I smashed these things together too fast. The home tantricus. That means a tantric housewife working at home. No, I'm not going to do, go that space. Uh, but the homo sapiens is something that privileges the sapientia, the wisdom of Western consciousness. To me, the tantric is about the dark, the unknown, the uncertain. Um, it's also about the struggle that goes with being human. If you if you read uh, philosophers like Prabhat Ranjan Sarkar, who's a guy that I've worked his work for a long time, and he's the guy also who coined um, the term neo-humanism, you know, we end up with this concept uh, Homo tantricus, which can is a creature of the future, as I say, he or she, if they will possess the skills of the present, but will apply them with love and an appreciation of the, of what humanity's existence is all about, you know, and, and so on. So for me, here's a shopping list. This is an ethics shopping list of sacred relationship, of that devotional stuff. You know, it links personal development, what we do in our own what life internally as well as what we do functionally, with collective well-being. I think we need, and it offers us an ethics of optimism. You know, this means an ethics of resistance, looking at, at Deleuze and Guattari. It's an ethics uh, pathway, okay, it's a process, it's not a given, it's not that formalist kind of ethics that, you know, measures and, and sort of assesses and balances things out. It's local and positional, it acknowledges the deep rootedness of people in place and in space, something that I've learned much from Laura Hajo's work on uh, uh, Indigenous Futurity, that's from her book Spiral of the Stars, which I've just got over there. It's also, uh, there's no demand on reciprocity, it's not, it goes way beyond the social contract, which is what Anantu was saying, and it's also about witnessing and listening at the, lim at the limits, in other words, language itself ultimately will fail us within an ethics of relationship and that means being present being conscious so for me homo tantricus is offers us something that's optimistic that's why i put a lovely flower there just as oh, uh, you know it shifts the focus away from the mind and and a vicious view of the humanity as fallen for me it suggests what i call in in my more recent publication called phenomenology of grace a grace hack I am a cup half full type of person or guy. I believe human beings can manage and open an inclusive ethics. One that is optimistic and promotes optimism and the spiritual as key values found in this inter-civilizational encounters that we're talking about. And drawing on Rutger Bregman's uh, really nice book, The Humankind, uh, he says, look, to stand up for human goodness is to stand up against the powers that be. In other words, we can resist actually to affirm that we can have an ethics of optimism is a form of resistance in itself okay so that's important so i wonder nothing lasts or endures says Bung Chun Hao Han who's a guy that i really enjoy reading the radical contingency awakens a longing for something that commits us beyond the ordinary something that's beyond the ordinary and i think that in a sense much of Han's work is actually addressing that thin imaginary that Steph was talking to. So in such a context, a genuine futures ethics can open up for me. It anchors us in a broader felt sense of relational being, one that nurtures benevolence as a cornerstone of our future work. So that's that my thoughts. Um, and I'm really looking forward to um, to engaging with you and of course Steph as well. Uh, and you know, I'll do my best to channel Ananta. So Sylvia, I'll let you uh, work it from here. Well, first of you, first of all, thank you so much to the three of you. <laughs> I think um, it's really complimentary and uh, the way Marcus, you've been able to 
engage on different topics and then put them in a, in a more complete theory of homo tantricus, then designing what could be uh, concepts for such an ethics and then connecting it with futures thinking, I think was really brilliant. Um, so thank you, thank you so much for taking the time to expose us, neophytes like me, <laughs> to these topics. Um, I see in the chat that we have many reactions. So I will um, maybe reach out now to uh, Ruth. I think you were one of the first one who had a lot of reaction to this. And I wanted to give you an opportunity to engage maybe more directly with Marcus, if you want to explain a little more um, your idea about this. Yeah. Ruth, are you able to talk? Oh, are you controlling the mute, so you, Sylvia? Yeah, I am. Unmute you. Mute it again. Hi. So, you know, just going back to the beginning when we were talking about Europe, Europeanization, I'm still quite interested in the concept of, or maybe the, I felt there might have been equivalization between the ethical, the Western ethical theories and the political structures. And I think capitalism has been mentioned a few times, um, but I was also suggesting that there may have been other political structures such as socialism, you know, um, admittedly coming out of Eastern Europe, you know, and Marxism, um, but then obviously then that's been split off into a number of different um, uh, types of socialism, I suppose, because you're East Asian uh, socialism and others. Um, but then there's this, you know, where do you, firstly, I am concerned about the equivalization because I do think that the Western ethical theories, and there are many, um, aren't necessarily exactly um, equivalent to saying they're all to do with capitalism and all, all about um, resource extraction. Um, but nevertheless, is it more around the political side and the economic imperatives and where does that sit with the Western ethics? But, you know, not discounting, um, I, you know, I'm, I really think it's very important that we do see all the other holistic cultural um, and I'm not even sure if they're, they're ethical frameworks or, or or something greater than ethical frameworks that we can learn from. But just coming back to that sort of Western critique, I suppose. Sorry, if you've got a commentary on that, that would be great. Thank you. Yeah, it's. I mean, there there are a whole bunch of things floating in there, Ruth. And I think Steph could probably address a number of them. But I just wanted to say before that you know, for me, culture equals ethics. I mean, all cultures have ethical frameworks. And I think we need to understand that. So the equivalization essentially comes down to the fact that um, there are clear connections between ethical positions and the concept of the good, the good outcome. So in a capitalist economy, of course, profits or growth is taken as a good. Um, but there is no uh, sense there of um, the responsibilities that accompany the achieving of a certain good over another. But I want to hand it over to Steph because I think that's, in a sense, some of this is much more in, the, in your era, area, uh, Steph. Yeah, I mean, I guess I'm trying to think of the, I think if, if we come back to like thinking in Deleuze and Guattari terms, there's a lot of nomadic traditions within the, the Western tradition that, you know, we can try to bring forward. So part of what, part of what I'm trying to do with my work and being, you know, a settler colonial myself and have lived in the three big, big ones, right? Australia, US and Canada. Um, how, how do we, how do we take responsibility for when the discipline tends to, uh, and our ideas of the world tend to overrun all others. And, and also, um, so how do we make it more open to thinking, right? Not always saying that if you, if you come here, you, you have to speak in our terms, right? So I do believe there's an incredible richness and depth to the Western intellectual tradition. And, un and unfortunately, one of the things it's tended to do is take a particular 
and I think I think about this a lot because I'm in international relations. It takes a particular and then makes it into a universal, and it kind of hides that notion that 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 was a particular notion. And I think so. Human rights are, you know, okay by and large, yes, absolutely, human rights. But um, at the same time, we that human that we call as a, a human is a very particular kind of human. And then we say, well, that's just the human everybody means. And and whereas. Um, in other traditions are thinking like, oh, well, that's not quite my human, right? I don't, um, I just listened to Sydney Environment Institute does a lot and I work in multi-species justice. Um, and maybe I can shift to the non-human. It's a better way to answer this for, from my point of view is that the, the um, right ideas of justice are profoundly anthropocentric and also profoundly generational, right? There is no, in, there's no, intergenerational justice because it's generally about fairness and distribution. So in our notions then of Western justice and uh, through roles and through social contract theory, we wouldn't even be able to see that we might owe things to people far away in time, right? And I think with future stuff that puts you guys in interesting space because you're kind of always in that, in that place, but justice finds it difficult to make that jump. Whereas other cultures wouldn't think of, um, they'd have different metaphors and analogies for thinking about time. You know, some cultures who see that the history is something we don't have to talk about because that's just disappeared behind us. There's nothing we can do. We're the only, the only thing we can talk about is forward, right? Um, and that, or looking seven generations ahead or the um, Maori understandings of how you are your own ancestor. And I was chatting about this with someone and they were saying that Maybe this was at maybe this was with Marcus at T where we were talking about also we have we think about our grandparents who did everything for their grandkids. So it's not as though we don't have a sense of this. So I guess my short answer is that we've got to pull out these places and these traditions and these minor strands of listen, we do have a communitarian way of doing, like like you're saying, like we we've got a socialist, we've got even noblesse oblige, right? Like we have these strands within that we have a kind of caring, compassionate conservatism. Um, and even though that's not enough, we can't discount the fact that as, I like um, Marcus's idea of fumbling, right? We're, we're trying to fumble. And capitalism itself is such a, um, capitalisms, I guess it's good if we say futures and histories and all, and worlds, right? Capitalisms, it doesn't always do the same thing in the same place. And it's really good for concentrating wealth, but then we don't reassign that wealth to places where it needs to be. So capitalism has become something that's all encompassing and in part because we let it, right? So I take what you're saying very, I, I think what you're saying is very true. We can't forget that we have all of these other things circulating here and the ways in which we come together and, and try to pull those into a global idea is the important bit, yeah. Uh, yeah. I have a small Sorry. question, sorry, <laughs> small semantic no, questions my, my, myself, but maybe it relates to this and, and then I will let you answer, Marcus. Um, sh should we at all use the word ethics or is the word ethics itself situated? And um, or is it something universal? Uh, I, I'd like maybe to have uh, your ideas on this. That's a really interesting question, Sylvia. I mean, as I said at the very beginning, ethics, the term itself has a history. So it's very much grounded in, you know, in the Western tradition. You, you go right back to Aristotelian ethics, you know, Nicomedean ethics and so on. So I, I think, as I said in the chat somewhere, where a number of us were talking about, you know, that language itself is problematic. So, you know, one of the things when we start thinking about ethics, of course, is that immediately we start getting to rules and balancing things out, you know, that formalism that I was talking about briefly. So to me, and again, it's, it's very much a, let's make it up as we go along. I mean, we're, we're working our way towards new futures. Now, if we, if we, if we address those futures optimistically, thinking that of, you know, drawing, calling on the best in human beings on and, you know, and so on. I think we start creating spaces where even the term of ethics may become redundant because it's about relationship. 
you know, and so it's about relationship with the biome, the ethnosphere, uh, you know, the water, the, the physical stuff as well of, of our world and our, our, our being. So to me, I think ethics comes as a term when we started analyzing and breaking down and trying to come up with recipes for the good as opposed to actually living it. That's why one of the things I like about Anunza's work so much, he talks about meditative verbs of co-creation. There's nothing concrete in that. In fact, you know, if you're a, a hard-nosed political scientist, nothing against you, Steph, but I know you're not, or, you know, a, a, an economist, you'd say, what the hell does that mean? How can I turn that into policy? So, you know, for me then, uh, yeah, ethics is deeply wounded. The concept itself is deeply wounded, but that doesn't mean that we can't, you know, uh, engage in triage like we're doing here. We can't say, you know, because if actually if we were to just go through the conversation we've had for the last one hour now and look at the number of ways we've used the term ethics, we keep coming up with new adjectives. We come up with the adjective to try and modify or push or shape or locate the ethics within a context. Steph, do you want to go on? Yeah, Maybe well, you can I, guess, I mean, I do, I think about this a lot and I started my first book with like, we need a new language, right? We need, but we don't need new jargon, right? We actually don't have words that encompass it. And other languages, like I've heard, like German has a word for everything. It's so great, right? <laughs> like, um, Whereas English tends to use like, or the, um, some have multiple names for love, right? That explain different kinds of love. So I think yeah. English itself as this kind of interesting, you know, pigeon Creole putting together of all these things has trouble with words. But I tend to see like, I guess for me, maybe, and maybe this is a really simplistic way of looking at ethics. Um, yes, I don't think I am really skeptical of justice being anything that could work. <laughs> And in the same place as you, Marcus, with ethics, like deeply wounded, traumatized. I'm not sure if we can, it's like taking duct tape and trying to fix things. I, we talked, I've talked about this elsewhere, like take duct tape and you try to fix all these Western traditions. And I know I had my main supervisor for my PhD was um, West African from Guinea. And he was like, nobody cares in Africa. Like nobody wants to duct tape anything. Like we've got our own ideas. We don't need you. And so that gave me a lot of kind of humbleness of, of what we could offer. Like, I don't, why are you duct taping it when the animists have already been thinking this way forever, right? Or these forms of cosmologies, like my um, supervisor was Grovigi, and that means that um, the clan that works with the chimpanzee, that they live together and think about each other. He's like, we've already done that. We don't need you telling us to have an ethics of entanglement. And I was like, fair enough, right? So we also have to remember that we should go in with a sense of humbleness. So for me, ethics is like a frame in which you create a frame in which then all different kinds of people, places, things operate within. And I hate to call it morals because I'm a good Nichan and I would say that morals are too... Um, the good and bad things problematic, but that you would create a like a frame in which everyone can come into it and then have their ways of engaging, um, have a place and a system and a follow through, right? Mm -hmm. So for me, that's that. And then one last thing I think if we look at, if we come back to the science bit, which I love, is that if we move away from um, just a Darwinist or neo-Darwinist understanding of evolution and look at Lynn Margulis, and if we talk about nomad things, right, this is definite nomad science that she fought for, but that much of our evolution comes from what we consume. So you, you literally are what you eat, right? And symbiogenesis comes about through, um, we are all um, evolving together in ways that, in ways that Darwinism and neo-Darwinism, that kind of species evolution still operates, of course, as does punctuated equilibrium with Lamarck and Stephen Jay Gould mm. and um, all the neo-Darwinists, but there's also something else there where we're like, we are a project. Um, I think one of the things I love to say to push people is like humans are a dog's greatest creation. Yep. Right. There wouldn't be though, we wouldn't be each other without one or the other. And if we think about ethics in that way, then if we think about dogs as a co-creation of human and, and at one point wolf, um, and maybe, you know, that, that what kind of ethical relationship do we have with such a deeply, deeply commensal species, such a deeply um, companion species to us? And that's an easy kind of fun one to do. It's a little harder when we talk about 
um, how do we live with viruses living through a pandemic? Like what's an ethical way to live on the world in a pandemic with SARS-CoV-2? Um, one way is certainly to quit digging into the planet in ways that are harmful to it. Um, so it's, it's, it's not always good. Like you can't put good and bad there, which is why I don't like to go to the good and bad. Because look, I just read an article yesterday from the ABC about the, uh, the new big highway going through. And they've had an increase in this bacterial infection that's quite serious. And it usually comes with typhoons or hurt, uh, things that churn it up, but it seems to be coming from this highway. So we have to make decisions. And I think Marcus brings up a good point. And maybe I'd love to hear more on this from people. How do we have policy around that? Like, how do we make decisions between them? Because I think we forget that we already have. Like I often have people um, yelling at me and saying like, well, would you pick a dolphin baby over a human baby? I'm like, well, that decision's already been made. Somebody already said the human baby was more important. So you're asking me a question from some from a place in which you've already made an assumption about the answer. What if we go back and think about how our seas also house these incredible beings that are intelligent and speak and have names and um, live lives rather than just wh whose baby matters more? That's a different question. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Stephanie. Um, the topic today is pushing the boundaries of ethics, and I think that's exactly what we're doing and what, what you're absolutely brilliantly explaining right now. So thank you so much. Uh, I see in the chat that um, we had a few people um, active in the question. I, I wanted to offer you um, the opportunity to talk um, or ask a question or just express your, your, your views as well, Barbara, Anne, uh, Christy. There, any one of you wanted to... Uh, express something. I think there was also a question from Ayesha. How can we create inclusive universal ethical frameworks? Large question. <laughs> yeah, I mean, that's, Hi, this is that's Barbara. That's a million dollar question. Barbara, go. Yeah. Yeah, this is Barbara. Yeah. Um, sorry for not putting the video on. Um, yeah, I think my question is kind of was answered by everybody. That's, um, you know, um, and I, and I like the idea of um, uh, what Marcus was saying about the thin and the uh, the thick imaginings. You know, we we need to really have thick relational moments. So if we are going to make that decision about the dolphin baby or the human baby, let's bring them into the room and have a thick conversation. You know, um, let's be totally related to bring all the other beings into the room as well that um, is involved in deciding about that. Um, yeah, so yeah, thank you. Uh, this conversation has been really terrific. Um, we, we need to have much more of this. Um, thank you. Yeah. Thanks, Barbara. That, that's, um, that really, I think about that a lot, like our spaces and one of the ways in which like are so able bodied, right? We actually have nothing but certain kinds of bodies in our spaces or things aren't, we can't bring our kids. Like why would we not have a campus, a university that allows children to come and have a common play area while their parents are, I have so many non-traditional students who are bopping out to check on, see if their kids made it on the bus. I'm like, why don't we have a space in which we forget, right? That they're all there because they're not there. And, and I know, if we, that we have to learn then how to speak for, I guess, animals, non-human animals that will never uh, likely communicate in language, but maybe let go of language a little and have people who can think beyond just language being the way we create community, which is, you know, Habermas, Rawls, all of those notions of justice and of rational beings all center on language, but only on human language, right? And we would always compare exactly. to- Exactly. Yeah, exactly. Well, um, I think it's, Kirsky, um, there's um, people who are um, Kirsky, um, I'm not exactly sure, um, who is doing um, a lot of work in the um, more than human um, research area. So as to, uh -huh. you know, there's now a method for interviewing plants. Yeah. Um, how, how do you do that? So I, I think it is developing. Um, we, you know, it just needs to be known a lot more. And people just need to think of this as an a possibility it's real we can do this we certainly cannot speak for others but we can find ways for speaking with them mm, exactly the with and for is so important <laughs> so important changes everything okay. 
what else do we have in the chat here? Yeah, I mean, yeah. Um, well, I'd like to jump in a little bit because I, one thing that always strikes me about ethics is that it's a practice. We do ethics all the time, but we do it unconsciously most of the time. And so to, to start working towards um, this sort of line of thought came from, who was it who asked about this? It was Aisha, was it? Someone asked about it and universal ethics or something uh, in the chat there. Um, yeah, Aisha. Uh, so thanks for the question because it's really an important one. But the, uh, for me, talking language and you bring it up as well, Sylvia, about, you know, what happens if you speak another language or, or whatever it might be? And of course, this is a reality that you have. I mean, there's a French part of your brain and there's an English part of your brain and probably other parts as well that are totally non-linguistic. Uh, one of the things that Deleuze and Guattari talk about is non-philosophy and, and addressing the aphasic and the acephalous. I mean, they're people who, or they, that which cannot speak and that which actually has no head in the in the way that we would recognize the human as you know the head has been the dominant we have senses we privilege over other senses we privilege um the eyes that we are a very visual culture you know mm -hmm. barbara you apologize for not having your screen on you know it, it, so it's you're recognizing visuality as a praxis but what does it mean? Well, the privilege is the objectifying because my eyes visualize and I can objectify a woman's body or an animal or a plant or anything. And of course, we've used that to navigate the world uh, since we were, you know, at pre-human species, pre-hominids. We all use visual acuity. But, you know, what does it mean then to say, well, if I'm blind, if we, if we actually remove that co component, orality, spoken the sound the taste the smell the sense of my skin interacting with the world i think these are areas that again locate us very much within a very specific place that has interesting tendrils because of tradition culture language and and so on going back into the past and leaking generations into the future and, you know, how do we deal with that? How do I communicate that? Well, some of the best ways I've found to communicate that is to actually dance and play with people, roll on the floor, get them to do the most non-cerebral, you might say, things to release a different form of communicative praxis. One where you can trust the people that you're rolling on the floor with. They're not going to grope you, for instance, or anything like that. It's actually a playful space of surrendering to other aspects of the communicative praxis. So that's that's me in a nutshell there. So Stephanie, do you want to add to that or add your own thoughts? Well, um, I wanted to come to this um, question from Basir, am I saying that right? Um, about anti-vaxxers, because weirdly I, I think it, it adds to this as well, because I've, and I've done some writing on this in the last year as far as an ethical, looking at the world ethically through immunological regimes. Um, it's, it's very, um, and thank you for the question, because I think it's a great one that helps us have an application. There's, there's one way to look at it with immune, and there's a beautiful book by um, Eula Biss um, uh, called on, I can't remember what it's called, it's easy to find. Anyway, I can always send it on to people. But part of the argument there is, there is no me and you, there's only us. So the ethics then in immune regimes are that you need to understand that um, people who kind of refuse to enter this, this um, immunological regime are actually te tearing us away from community mindedness because their notions of freedom have also to do, there's another word, right, that was highly wounded. <laughs> um, freedom isn't about, um, freedom isn't about being less connected to people and doing whatever you want. Freedom through this immunological is about being more connected. So what we're seeing here with this is a is a clash of these notions of freedom. And I think I was thinking the other day, I gave a talk on kind of what it is to be human and attachment. Like we have a weird sense of attachment and thinking about Buddhist sense of attachment helps us here, right? Like what are we attached to? What does violence to us? And I think the anti-vaxxers um, are going, like how do we live with the consequences of someone's personal choice that isn't that? that's the kind of ethics that's super hard, right? Because you're not making a decision for yourself, you're actually making a decision for someone else. And that mm -hmm. um, leads to really complex ways of understanding it. So I think um, what happens when we open up the Queensland borders, right? And 
people aren't vaxxed, what like they have made then a decision and as far as I can see to isolate themselves. They have made the decision to no longer go out. But whether that is plainly seen by people because of their notions of freedom as being doing whatever they want, I find fascinating. And that's a huge ethical conundrum and shows yeah. a place where our politics and words are broken, right? Uh, thank yeah. you. The, the reason why, way back in 2013, I took part in a simulation and uh, there were several national security, uh, this was unclassified, several national security threats and anti-vaxxers, <laughs> anti-vaxxer parents actually was a, uh, one of the uh, threat lists. And uh, so, you know, seeing anti-vaxxers from being uh, parents to all the way to a much larger population and actually creating influence maps and actually, so I don't know. So here's the specific question. So do you think handing people a document, opt-in or opt-in, opt-out? So everyone has to get a, a vaccination and they unconditionally. So by, by means of opting out, these people would perhaps forfeit certain rights and accept certain uh, responsibility and so forth and liability. I don't know. I'm just you're the ethicist. I'm throwing oh, the I, idea. Thank you very much. I, Wonderful explanation. I hear you. No, I think it really brings us down to some very problematic moments of how we do this, right? And I think that part of the, the conspiracy problem that we have in our politics is about a democratic gap. We also, and then that's so clear in so many places. And I think if we fix, if we fix other gaps in our politics, right, the yeah, the trust deficit, deficit, the people don't trust politicians. Um, I think we have a, a system in which we can't actually engage in. Um, and then we've got someone else who puts on, who has commented on um, anti-vaxxers problematic and um, that the other kinds of immune, immunological responses is another form of colonization. And indeed it's a, a Western and a Western science understanding um, of the way in which our bodies work, but Im immune responses are, um, the, the, the immune system is very interesting in that it, it welcomes everything in and needs to have markers of um, non-self to it. So really what immunological vaccinations are doing is just asking your body to recognize something that might be dangerous to it. So maybe different ways of talking about the way in which this is affecting your body would be helpful as opposed to it always being some kind of forced choice, but rather the processes in which immune response works is about letting you live in a society where we can all be together, right? Like Ulibis says, it means you can hug people. It means you can go out and have dinner. Um, so all the things that it means to live together are getting lost in just these ideas of what you might have personal choice for and often don't travel well to other places like women's autonomy over their bodies or indigenous autonomy over their bodies, right? Those things aren't traveling. We're not respecting other things. Um, yeah, and again, very complex. Lots of lots of feelings, lots of beliefs, lots of things that can't be ignored. Um, and you know, kind of, I think too much to go into here. But a future moving together in a world that has more and more species jumping viruses because of our ecological actions—it's something we have to deal with. Yeah. I think there's something really interesting and when, when you're saying also a lot of feelings involved and and people can be triggered depending on traumatism they have lived and so on and um there's a lot of studies around morals and how morals are linked to our disgust or our um, emotions and and so on um what do you pers personally believe um uh, in terms of ethics, how can we include or not include our emotions or this sensitive aspect? I, I have the feeling from what you've been telling us today that um, with this more open approach to ethics, more indigenous views, uh, we are more open to our sensibility, to poetry, poetry or poetics and so on. So what could be an ethics that takes into account not just rational, um, principles, but also something more sensitive. And I, I know, Stephanie, you have only 10 more minutes left, so I want to make sure that everybody got a chance to, to, to ask you um, their questions. So that, that was one of 
I have, but uh, if you want to take one from the audience as well, I, I'm fine with that. Well, and I see um, Christy's commented about moving past individual liberty and freedom means moving past neoliberalism and attachment to the bodies. Yes, like um, that's part of it is we're also dealing with really large, right? Cosmologies, worldviews, theoretical frameworks in which um, we have to, if we don't think about our bodies as um, uh, brains in a vat or, right? Because we're not, we're constantly interpolated by the world, right? Our immune system brings in more than it does. Our skin is quite like, it isn't the barrier that we think it is. There are all these ways. Um, and yes, the, the idea that we would look at what's the root causes of species jumping viruses is absolutely vital, right? And we do know that species and habitat destruction and being piled on top of each other, we're making our own problems here, right? And also hurting a lot of other things in the meantime. Um, so like, Raphael says, are we thinking ethics of viruses? I'm, I'm currently trying to think about this. I've talked about the viral, the viral biome and now I'm doing the viral. And it is, it is super fascinating. Like, and it really does change your view. The microbial um, in a bacterial or eukaryotic or prokaryotic. And then you look at the, the viral, which viruses aren't life either. It also shows how fungible our life is. There's only one virus we would think of as alive and it's a giant virus that's found in the Arctic or the Antarctic region. So we're also dealing with like the, the what we think is alive and what isn't. So we're dealing with basically, you know, to come back to Basir's point about looking at this largely, we're dealing with an actor in global security um, that isn't alive, but has, and has actually have intention at a level in which we could understand it. But of course, has an intention as it moves through bodies in particular ways. It's all like, I think we could do so much if we just thought about these things. Um, and if they don't, like Marcus says, do they have agency? Not in our ways of saying, like that agent thing is totally shot through with anthropomorphism. We can't use it, right? Which is why movement toward act and see, or again, we're talking about these, we need to change the idea of agency from always working in a structure or always having some kind of committed right things that act and see through semiotics and through Latour. And I think, and these are all again, like white um, European thinkers, there's all kinds of ways to think this through other, through other traditions, right? The way you would see um, our interrelationship with species have been subsumed in our culture, but can I think be brought out, especially in having conversations with others. I, and so I can get, get back to you guys on this. I'm working on this viral political ecology right now, how we do it. It would be fun to come back and give another talk once I've sorted that, <laughs> sorted that out. Cause I do think it opens up a lot of very useful and good things moving forward potentially, or I won't say good, productive, productive things in which we can rethink our attachments. Mm -hmm. I see that Ayesha and Samantha are expressing themselves in the chat. Do you want to ask the last question to Stephanie before she has to jump out? New, new ontologies, yes. Um, and, and ontologies of be, like becoming and how we become together. Because the other thing I guess about a Western tradition is it tends to think in stasis, right? It's ontologies of this is the way it's been. Um, I'll give one last example, maybe that's helpful. If we have, and what I did in my work is we talk about the body politic, right? This is something we talk about in politics and we compare mm -hmm. we compare our body to, um, and, and naturalize our politics through our bodies. We have the organs of the state, we have the family of nations, right? We tend to really make these corporeal metaphors. And that if we're thinking about a body that's in flux and, and shot through with um, bacteria and, and viral assemblages and ways in which um, our brains work to connect to other mammals, then this is creates a not a stasis, not an ontology of stasis, right? Like we would see in Hobbes. And this, this is the body period. Well, well, what if these bodies are different, right? Like, and what if they're non-human bodies? And what if they're bodies that are differently abled? And that body politic becomes super interesting, right? Again, to just draw back on my supervisor, because he always um, messed my, you know, white folks thinking head up. He said, I have 26 brothers and sisters. 
and everyone in, like everyone in our village when you're born at a certain time those are your brothers and sisters as well and that those and that creates this huge kinship whereas we have these like let's come back to thin again right we have these really thin notions of the family like you're my you're my half brother you're my half sister you're my stepfather whereas another culture would be like no i'm an auntie i'm like i fulfill all these things so i do think that's the universe, like we would say family. And I think people in this thin nuclear families would say like, oh, I understand family. Whereas everyone else is like, oh no, you don't. Like you don't get it at all. So watch the kind of things that bring to it and the more we can put into it. Um, yeah, and this whole, um, as Samantha saying that nature land is an extension reflection of the body being. If that's the case, I think we come back to Marcus and, and Anta well and say, this is, what we've created on this planet is kind of a sick expression of a sick body. And if we think about them to heal them, um, we'll find kind of a health globally and that health will be reflected back and forth between individual bodies on it. I think at some point, uh, someone in the chat mentioned uh, spiral dynamics. How do you relate to that uh, framework? Or are you uh, familiar with the universe? I'm not familiar with that, wow. so okay. I'll, I'll I mean look it up. Marcus? Spiral dynamics is a um, is a way of describing the journey of consciousness, um, but it is uh, from you know, and, and people will disagree. There's there's a lot of you know contestation around spiral dynamics. It offers us some very interesting tools in thinking about human becoming, but it's also very uh, much uh, categorizing in that essentialist sort of sense that people are at this level, others are conscious at this level, this level. Uh, it, it came up in, I think maybe it was Ruth brought it up, I'm, I'm not sure, but um, it came up in connection to the, the book uh, Spiral to the Stars, but Spiral to the Stars is a totally different book, which is why I put the link in there. If you're interested in the text, it's it's in the chat. Awesome, um, and so, there's yeah. a great link that Barbara put into for a new paradigm um, toward relational sustainability research, which I just briefly looked at. It looks fantastic. Yeah, and because so Steph's about to go, I just want to cheer Steph up a little bit. Not that she needs it, but I just wanted to share something just to make you smile, Steph. Okay. Talking about evolution. Uh, <laughs> I've seen this. I've seen this going yeah. around. Yep. Yeah. <laughs> That's it's, great. it's a little viral, but it, it meme. <laughs> it's a great meme. I just love it. So, so good. Um, um, thank it, you. That's okay. So <laughs> that's my well, thank you for you joining yes. us, Steph. And thanks all for your generosity. It's been great. I, I feel really blessed these last couple of weeks. I've had such good conversations with people around the globe. So whatever time frame you're at, if you're sacrificing a late night or an early morning, I appreciate you being here. Thanks, thank everybody. you so much, Stephanie. It was wonderful yeah. to have you here with us today. Yes. Thank Hope to do more in yeah, the future. Thanks, Steph. Bye. I'll catch up with you. I'll catch up with you soon. Sounds good. <laughs> Um, if you have a little That's more it. time, um, I don't know if you have maybe a couple last question for Marcus or Marcus, if you have maybe a final comment, or if you want to, to, to let us know about um, your current work, or if you have a final message, please feel free to take the time to do it. Yeah. Right, let's see if there's a question first from anyone. Uh, yes. Thanks for the interesting generation. Oh, Basir for the turquoise. Thank yeah. you. Okay. is raising his hand. So please yeah, that's it. Hi, Marcus. I just uh, kind of withheld the question because uh, there was such wonderful discussion going on. Now, I came to learn about the term Hadithian interpretation of the law, that the whole diabolical thing, which kind of really explains what some of the lawyers and the judicial system and things are doing. Now, the uh, lawfare, be it from state and non-state, it seems like uh, our legal security is completely gone. If you have a, a friend who's a prosecutor or a relative or a judge, you're kind of like set. Otherwise, you have to acquire legal insurance or uh, set up a legal defense fund and what have you. So there is that uh, a lot of things are going on, both at, at a hostile state level, but also through corporate warfare. So like, you know, heavens forbid, if you get into a conflict with a large company, so in that regards, I mean, and you have a very positive outlook. So how do we basically uh, pass through the current bottleneck of, I guess, uh, toxic lawfare or toxic ethics of companies and uh, 
certain states yeah. and so forth, which basically robs Magna Carta. And uh, it is, I have a lot of illustration that I could, uh, that I would love to provide some other time. Thank you. Yeah, I mean, that's, I mean, it's a huge area. And in fact, Steph would have been in some respects better positioned to, to respond to that. But yeah, from, from my perspective, uh, when we, what we see is the law always on the back foot responding to things. So people create messes and then the law comes in retroactively to try and deal with that. So, and also the insurance does the same thing. So in a sense, they're indicators of um, the tensions around concepts of agency acting and Steph just shot agency so I'll say agency uh, you know instead um, and I uh, so for me what we are faced with is a an incredible confluence between elements of the unknown that are simply because of scale the scale of large corporations the scale of you know uh, governments and, and you know uh, the way that they can handle, manipulate, control the biopolitical, that means the political and the bodies of, the, of us, you know, telling us vaccinate, not vaccinate. You can, in Australia, we can't travel necessarily from one state to the other and so on. So we've got a, a range of elements at that level that are totally daunting to people who, our culture, very individualistic. Uh, we, we all like to have our, our own security, which is our home usually, or our camper van if you don't have a home. Or, you know, this is my bench if you're a, if you're a, a homeless person in a, in a city. Uh, but we tend to, to kind of withdraw ourselves in. But one of the things I think that Steph's talking to, and certainly Ananta is as well, and you know, I'm heading in that direction, is, the, is reversing that trend. To actually, rather than to withdraw and focus on security and the ethics of security and safety and individualism, is to somehow change the narratives. And that's where somebody brought up metaphors, and it was Steph actually, and then I jumped in and said, metaphors shape the way we think in, in, in ways. And of course, we've got George Lakoff and people like that who've written about the, the, the power of metaphor. But uh, deeper down than that, that there is that the metaphoric is the pre-linguistic. So, and of course, I, as I said, I've, I do a lot of history teaching. And one of the things that interests me is the emergence of the state as a response to uh, disorder and also the creation of co different kinds of surpluses that allowed elites to sort of take control over large areas of um, of energy really whether it was you know, grain surpluses before we had currency or money but what we what we can see is that human beings at different key points in our evolution as communities have had to deal with this question of scale in different ways and what we've got now is uh, we're the scale of human activity is colliding with and contesting the scale of planetary activity. And I think this is where we can see the planet reasserting itself through climate change, through, you know, viral um, pandemics and so on. And I think we are, over the next few generations, going to negotiate new spaces. The legal stuff will always fail us. Why? Because it actually feeds off distrust and the failure of communities to function as we possibly potentially could, could in a world where we see the best in human beings and that where we have education systems and social systems that foster the, the optimal as opposed to feeding into the deficit models. Education is all about the deficit model. The kid comes in, they're empty, so we have to fill them up. You know that old cliche, but it's, it, Essentially, that metaphor is still very much the heart of things. It's very much the heart of the way learning works. We don't trust learning to occur. So we mandate legally that every parent needs to send their kids to, you know, basically to prison for a 12 years uh, sentence at least from, you know, and, and you know, I'm dramatizing it, but, you know, I, I feel like that because I spend a lot of time working with small schools. I'm on school boards, Montessori and uh, near humanist school and so on. I've worked in small schools, as, as Sylvia said in, in her intro for me. You know, I know how difficult it is. And I see the aspirations and the, and, the, and the hope of parents for their 
children, but I also see the level of fear that parents have to deal with, for instance, about am I actually equipping my child for a successful future? Are they going to be, you know, I, I used to think in terms of the uh, um, rainbow metaphor, how many guns, knives and everything do you need to have your kid have to go out and cut it in the world? And, you know, I have to say, Sylvia, I've been spying on you. I, I listened to the Future Pod talk where you're talking uh, uh, with Peter about the, your, your background and your and growing up with two engineers as parents and, and so on. You know, it's really, really interesting because those stories I relate to so much because they, we have to come back to the, to the human and then to the more than human. So it's my story. I can tell you stories. Step, we're all drawing on our stories. As I, I gave a talk two days ago to a group of parents, I said, look, teaching is about autobiography. All I can do is draw on my own experience to communicate it with you. The fact that I've been fortunate enough to run around the planet, that I, I play music and I am write poetry and read poetry and do all these other creative things along with being academic or whatever it might be is means that we can have messy conversations and that I can feel comfortable holding a space where I actually have no idea where we're going. <laughs> so Sylvia, back to you. Absolutely, that's a strong message you've been sharing with us today. So thank you so much. Um, really appreciate the time you, you spend with us. I, I'll use the last few minutes um, to share um, with the 15 participants that are still with us now, uh, what we are planning for the next session. But um, just before that, a big applause to the three of you and Marcus for coordinating with, uh, with uh, Stephanie and Ananta, including the video. I think having Ananta was wonderful also because we could really um, share also different uh, cultural views. So wonderful that yep. you included. Uh, so the video will be available on the APF um, website. And I just... Um, share what we are planning for our next session so really hoping to have you uh, next time so next month we'll meet on december 9 um, the time is not fully decided but uh, most likely it will be with you ruth uh, thank you for being with us today i think so you got a, a good idea of how it works <laughs> um, if you want to to co-create a presentation with someone else also feel free we like to have different perspectives though um, if someone is interested in the topic of AI ethics and wants to join Ruth from the audience today of Ruth, if you think of someone else, of course, feel free to build something together. Uh, we also had uh, Raphael, which who I think left because it might be very late now in France, um, probably talking about the Anthropocene, um, maybe January or February. Uh, we discussed also with Alain, I think Alain is still there, uh, talking about justified violence in fiction at some point. So maybe we should schedule this one sometime soon. Uh, I've been also exchanging with Greg Solis and uh, Rachel Noonan, who are two designers interested into designing ethical futures, like really designing it into products, uh, talking about the designer as ethical responsibility in designing with every human in mind. So this topic of universality, again, um, would be an interesting topic. Topic will probably have something around March. And we still have Essex of Wars number two coming up. And uh, another topic with, uh, about around future literacy and indigenous perspective, probably with um, UNESCO, um, Eva Kwamu Fekke here. Uh, so these are a few things we have um, in our programmation. If you want to be added to it, or if you want to work on those topics, uh, we like really to have, such as today, different views, makes the conversation more engaging and more diverse. I think it's always interesting. So don't hesitate to reach out to either Chris or myself. Um, and of course, if you have questions, don't hesitate also to ask us uh, or to reach out to our guest today. I think that will be my final word. Uh, one big thank you again, Marcus and Stephanie and Anenta. Um, I think that was amazing. I was expecting, um, looking forward to that session, but I think it really uh, was beyond my expectation. So thank you so much for bringing such great content to our group. Um, I don't know if you have any final word. I leave you close the session if you want to, to, to give us a little more of your wisdom before we close the conversation. I know what I'll do. I'll read you a poem from my book. 
Amazing. <laughs> How does that sound? That's not that's not getting too all sort of soft and mushy, is it? <laughs> um, this book uh, it's called the next big thing, and I'll read you the poem. The next big thing is uh, these are my closing thoughts. To be human is to both love and fear. To rush in and with open hearts where fools fear to tread. To flee in terror at the shadows that haunt our dreams. To be human is to bear this contradiction as the pilgrims wore the shell badge on the road to Compostela. Yet my humanity is tight on me. I feel our skins cracking at the need to love more, fear less. I am called to trust in greater things, cast off the weight of the past and seize new opportunities to love and work in love for richer futures where a new humanity can breathe clean air. When I love, I am expanded. Fear cuts me off, diminishes me. And when I fail to see the pattern, fail to connect the dots and taste my connection to all that is. To move beyond fear is the next big thing. To take up love as a challenge that enables. To realize the power of collective movement where the most mundane of experience reveals itself in a myriad of ways to be a message to me and you that we can be so much more. Thank you very much. Take care. Blessings. Thank you. Amazing. Thank you so much. Uh, I think some people in the chat are trying to connect together. So I think Elisa and Ruth at some point, um, if you cannot reach to each other, let us know and we'll, we'll share your emails and so on. Um, thank you again, Marcus. I love that you ended uh, with such a profound message uh, and in the poetry form. I, I, I love that so much. Thank you so much. Thank you. Okay. Take care. Take care, you too. Uh, Thank you, everyone. Thank you for participating. Bye. -bye. Bye.